Oh, thank you, Pamela. And thank you so much, everyone who's joined us today. It's just a pleasure to be here and on this beautiful day um, here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm, I feel inspired to go and sketch. And today, I really hope to share some tools and techniques to inspire you to go out and uh, go do some sketching and have some fun out in the world. Um, I'm a huge fan of Opus Art Supplies, um, just north of us from here in Port Townsend. As a, a little arts company, it's just been thrilling to have resellers such as them start to carry our products. And I have family up in Victoria, so I, I am hoping to spend some time up in the region in person soon. So I just really want to thank Opus for having me today. Ah, I thought I'd start today by sharing a little bit of a background about myself as an artist and how I uh, helped create Art Toolkit. And then I wanna give a little tour of some of the tools and then invite you to sketch along with me on um, some different examples that we'll do. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Oh, and uh, if you've got any questions, if you want to post them in the chat, that's wonderful. And Hopefully at the end of our demo, we may have a little opportunity for some sharing um, if we're able to, to spotlight you um, or um, in the least, uh, we'll fi figure out something here. So really happy to be here with you all. Uh, so a little background about myself. Uh, I've been an expeditionary artist. Everyone, Pamela, is that coming through okay there? Uh, yes, it's looking good. Wonderful. Um, since I graduated from Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota in 2004, and people say, well, what, what's an expeditionary artist? And the first thing I like to say is, it's great to make up your own job title. And for me, as an expeditionary artist, it's been about bringing together my passions for art, science, and exploration. And this is a video of me up in Greenland some years ago, sketching out in the world. You can see this is actually before I had pocket palettes. I've got an older palette there. But there's there's just something about being in the world where um, I love sketching on site. I remember things more vividly, paying attention to details, thinking about art as a tool. And I, I love to develop what I call my palette of place, a vocabulary of color, climate, stories, and experiences. So there's that completed sketch. Uh, Sometimes on site, you know, I may not have time for a full completed painting and wanted to show you some examples. As an expeditionary artist to uh, branch out a little bit more there, it's brought me primarily to polar and glaciated regions where my passion has been working with scientists to help tell stories of their work through art, through exhibitions and museums, also um, non-traditional gallery, galleries such as science centers, uh, and presentations, and then um, to, uh, to, to help, help share that work. And so in the field though, I, I may not always have time for a complete painting. And so sometimes I might start with a color study. And this is an example from Greenland where I worked on a fabulous project called Imaging the Arctic with a polar bear and narwhal biologist named Kristen Lydra who works with the University of Washington Applied Physics Laboratory. So after doing those color studies, this is a little uh, village settlement in Greenland, Northwest Greenland called Niaornad. And I had time to do a pencil sketch, but the weather was hard, right? It can be challenging to sketch outdoors. And one thing I'll emphasize today and the tools I'll share is working quickly and letting go of perfection. In fact, one of my mantras that I encourage you all to repeat to yourselves, just give yourselves a little mutter, is practice not perfection really embracing process. So on this particular piece, I came back another day. And in fact, I'd um, traced the original painting so I could speed things up and worked on painting it. Now, this one was coming right along. But I, uh, I got distracted when my friend came along and asked if I wanted to go out in a helicopter and look for narwhals, to which I immediately said yes, and left my painting. So this is a piece that I ultimately completed at home. But having the field sketches was such a critical part of that, being on site, building that palette of place. I wanted to share a couple more examples. And here you can see a little picture of my studio as well, where I am right now, my home studio. And this is another little evolution of a field sketch to a studio painting, something I really enjoy doing. And these are eggs of guillemots, black guillemots, with a project I from a project I did with a ornithologist named George Devoki, 
who has the longest uh, nonstop, he's consecutive, um, field research study. He's been going to the same island every year, I think for 49 years now, off the north slope of Alaska studying these birds. So up on the upper left, that sketch is my field sketch done on a paper I'll show you in a minute. And then I have a studio study, a little five by five painting, and finally the big studio painting which was a full uh, 40 inches long wide. And here's one more example of from the field to the studio from that project in Alaska of a quick field sketch in the upper left, a little studio study, and then working on a larger scale. You might say, Maria, why aren't you working on a larger scale in the field? Well, again, the time on site, the uh, conditions and the types of paintings I do in my studio tend to be uh, repeated layers of paint that take time to dry. I uh, wanted to share a little bit of the inspiration I've had uh, from other artists. And first is an artist named Thomas Moran, whose work in the um, late 1800s, early 1900s helped inspire the creation of the National Park System in the United States. And I saw an exhibit of his, I think, in 1998 in Seattle at the Seattle Art Museum. And I was struck just by the, the sheer power of his paintings, of the, the seeing, you know, the emotional impact of them and the power of images to help, you know, take us to these spaces. And his paint, oil paintings were really impressive and big. That little one on the lower left is 12 feet wide. But what really impressed me were his field sketches because it felt like I was just leaning over his shoulder, looking down the immediacy and that, that handmade quality. Uh, so that's a little uh, about 11 by five inch on toned paper, which again, I'll show you in our demonstration. Uh, another artist who's inspired me is Edward Wilson. And Edward Wilson went down on expeditions to Antarctica with Robert Falcon St Scott, where unfortunately he died, I believe in 19, well, 1912. <laughs> ill-fated uh, expedition to the South Pole. But what I really admire about Edward Wilson is he wore a number of hats. He wore the artist hat. Uh, he was also a doctor, so he was the doctor on board. And then he was um, this naturalist scientist studying birds. And his watercolors brought back these vivid, colorful images um, from the field. That, uh, And I also learned a tip from his journals to add a little alcohol to my paints to lower their freezing temperature. So that's a little tip. Uh, preferably, you know, gin or vodka, something clear will work best in a pinch rubbing alcohol. And finally, Emily Carr is, is an inspiration uh, to me of just her intrepid nature of going out into the woods and up to the Native American vi villages and painting totem poles in their local settings and the forest and um, her, her courage in spending the time in the field is an inspiration to me and, and the museum up in Victoria is, is just amazing. So that's a little background of some of the artists who inspired me. And then for myself as an artist, it's always been, for me, a tool. Began as a tool for expressing my emotions. Here I am expressing my emotions about cleaning my room to my father. As I'm saying, nope, I can't do that. It's gotten so messy, I can't open the door. I drew it all the time. And then later on growing up, I had the opportunity to spend time in Tokyo, Japan with my family, where my father was invited to teach. And we lived down the street from this amazing Japanese brush maker named Mr. Sakuma, who really took me under his wing. And I thought about art as a tool for bridging language barriers, bridging differences. Because I didn't speak much Japanese, he didn't speak much English, my mother was a big help, but we would sit and paint and sketch and I would practice. And I have dozens of his paintbrushes that I use in my studio, as well as one made out of my own hair, which I'll, I'll show you briefly. Um, that is not that large brush at the bottom there. <laughs> that is a very large poster painting brush made of horse hair. But he gave me when I was 11 or 12 years old a brush um, uh, as a coming of age gift that was told me was a tradition in Japan that helped helped inspire and inform who I am today. So art as a tool. And in high school and afterwards, I began thinking about art as a tool for learning and science, because again, that attention, that tool for attention leads to, to curiosity, asking questions, 
And when I would draw something, I'd remember it more vividly. And these are some images from a project I've done to try and become a better naturalist. I, I did about 70 of these for a bird project. Um, and I found just doing one a day, that act of drawing helped me learn, remember things, and, and get stimulate my curiosity. And then I've always loved sharing art with others and thinking about art as a tool for education and getting others outside. And it, it's, it's all well and good for me to love my own art, but it's just been such an honor to get to help inspire and empower others to go use art as a tool. So that art as a tool versus a talent is just something I believe deeply in and helped inspire the creation of Art Toolkit, uh, which began, I think, in about 2012. It's been um, just over 10 years now that I've been making these. And um, <laughs> I want to shift gears now to doing some sketching with you. This is one of my best students, and so I'm assuming you're all going to giving me the same attention as this wonderful little penguin here. <laughs> and um, before we dive in, um, here's as promised, this is this paintbrush of my own hair that um, my brush maker made of me, uh, for me. And um, when he chopped off my ponytail as a consolation, he gave me this brush. I was, I was quite sad to lose my ponytail at the time. And so these are some of my paint brushes. Um, and before we, we dive in sketching, thinking about the tools we have to sketch, I wanted to share with you some of my favorite sketching tools. And then we'll practice too some things with our senses that, of course, we can use at all times. And um, oh, and I see some questions in the chat. So, um, Pamela, I'll let you, if you can keep an eye on that, feel free to interrupt me at any time with some questions. I'll, I can keep a half eye, but um, I'm happy to answer as many questions as I can. Um, so, tools that I love, of course, watercolor palettes. And I wanted to share with you why I started Art Toolkit, because I was going on these expeditions and everywhere, every trip, I began thinking about how can I carry my tools with me in as compact of a way possible. And uh, I began making palettes a long time ago. I love tinkering with things. And here is an early palette I made uh, that is made in an Altoids mint tin. And I filled it with Sculpey paint punched holes in the Sculpey with a pencil, spray painted it, and filled it with paint. And, and it's rather cute, and I took it backpacking, but it, it's really heavy. And so I thought, you know, I think I can do better than this. So the next palette that I made and um, has been a number of places with me, including um, Greenland, was made out of a, a pen box. And this was cool because I started to think, okay, I can get my own empty pans, put them on magnets, spray painted the inside, but this was still bulky. And when I was up in Greenland, I was working on a project with a walrus biologist. We were staying up in this little camp on the northeastern coast of Greenland. And we were sneaking up on walruses to uh, take little tissue samples from them, learning about the population. And uh, my job was to be a general helper and do my sketching. And so Sneaking up on these walruses, this is one I did on site. First, we'd be wearing our big puffy gear because it was chilly. And we put on these all-in-one like machinist suits, right? So I'm kind of zipped up with a machinist suit over everything. And then I've got my gear with me. So I've got my sketch kit, my watercolor palette, camera, where I love taking pictures for reference photos, inspiration. Something else I really love too is taking audio recordings. So I've got my little audio recorder. And then we're sneaking up on these animals. So to sneak up on them, and, and don't do this at home, only, only under the supervision of a scientist, we'd get down low because a vertical figure would scare them and we'd be downwind. And then eventually we'd be commando crawling in the sand up to them. And my gear sometimes, like my sketchbook, would like fall down my suit a little bit and it felt awkward. And so I thought, gosh, <laughs> I really want to try and keep everything as compact as possible. So it was after that trip that I began tinkering with little pocket palettes. Here's a really early one out of a business card tin and finding little pans that I could play with so that they could mix and match and really be a modular palette. And 
this is what today has grown into the art toolkit where now we've got these two sizes of kits that can really hold everything. Here, I'll show you a couple of our newer colors. We've just got a line of, of new colors that I'm really excited about. And so the idea of these zipper kits where then inside you can keep everything you need to sketch. And key to this zipper kit, zip cover art toolkit, are the pocket palettes, which are these versatile little palettes with a magnetic base that we've now done many iterations on, where they've got this nice little low base, so you've got all access to your pans, little side walls, so that your paint isn't going to spill out the side. And um, I think we've got four or five different sizes of pans now. We've got this great big one, a uh, medium <clears throat> mixing pan, a little square one, and then, can't quite hold these all up here. I'll go to my desk view soon. Getting even smaller to a little mini pan. And we did the math a few years ago before we had this big one, thinking, hey, how many different uh, possible arrangements are there for this palette? And I thought, oh, thousands maybe, right? And I posted this to my blog and started getting comments. And two people wrote computer programs to help us figure it out because it's, it's 40 million. And with this pan, I don't wanna know how many more million, well, I do wanna know actually, I should, I should get back in touch with these, these computer folks. <laughs> but there's just millions of possibilities. And we went further um, to creating a little teeny tiny palette. This one's called the Demi palette. And this Demi palette, whoops, um, can hold little, we have the mini pans and other, other pans you can arrange it in, but even smaller, really, truly pocket-sized. And then we also launched a couple years ago, one that's twice the size called a folio palette. So we now have a total of three sizes of these palettes. And they're so slim that even our biggest is truly sketchbook size, like small sketchbook size. So you can still just carry it everywhere. And being so slim, they're, they're really convenient. And one of my tips for my palettes is um, sometimes I'll create a little color card to track my colors, but I also have a little label maker. And so I'll label the backs of my pans to help remember what they are. Here's a little Hansa Yellow Medium by Daniel Smith. And my palettes evolve as I, as I play with different variations. This is one I put together for an artist residency I had in Norway. And that, that is the tricky part maybe is just narrowing down your layout and colors. And I love seeing the different arrangements artists come up with. So please, if you ever wanna post a photo to Instagram, just tag us and we'd love to see how you're using your palettes. So <clears throat> palettes, other tools. Um, sketchbooks. I love sketchbooks and I sometimes work loose leaf. And um, in the field, I might do a heavier watercolor paper, but I wanted to show you a um, paper that I really love as well. And it's called a Canson Me Tense. And uh, Maria, I have a question for you. <clears throat> yes. The question popped out up about how, how do you have enough paint for a whole residency? So um, just curious, like how long will the little paint pans last, do you think? Oh, that's a great question. And hold on one second while I get a little hot water here. <clears throat> My voice is just starting to catch. Our double pans hold the equivalent amount of paint as a standard half pan. So they can last a long time. And one thing I think about for layout is if there's a color I'm gonna use more of, I'll do a bigger pan. One that I use less of, a smaller pan. And this palette I had filled a bit more and topped off, you know, it was uh, since Norway, but lasted me for, for a two week trip. No problem. Even my smaller palettes have lasted. So coming to pens and brushes, a little bit about palettes and sketchbooks. I love waterproof pens. It's one of my favorite things about sketching. I'll use pencil sometimes, but I like that a pen really shows you a record of what you explore and see. And as I mentioned, I really embrace practice, not perfection. And I want to share a pen that Opus carries that I enjoy that I'll use on occasion. And this is called the Copic Multiliner. 
And I use this in different sizes. This one's 0.25. I also really like 0.35. You can experiment with lines. But what's cool about these is they're refillable. So you can take out the tip and replace the tip if that breaks. And they've also got an ink cartridge that you can replace and pop in and out. There's other fountain pens I like too. <clears throat> But this is a nice mix for not, it's not going to leak on you if you're going into the mountains and it uh, gets a beautiful fine tip. Another pen that I really love for the variety of uh, mark making possibilities you get with it is the Pentel brush pen. This is a waterproof ink and with this brush tip, you've got a really wide range of gestural marks you can make to quickly fill in an image. And finally, all the time in the field, and what I'm gonna demonstrate with today is a Pentel water brush pen. There's other brands of water brushes. And this one <clears throat> I like because one, it's oval. It's not gonna roll away. <clears throat> And let's say you're on a boat or you're out in the mountains or even at a coffee shop. It's nice not having your tools rolling around. And next, the tip is really durable. I found it's just lasts a really long time. And so having, um, and, and you know, will hold its tip well. And I have a, an almost eight-year-old, so I've got experience too with uh, kids <laughs> using our tools. For sketchbooks and paper, this one is a cream-toned paper and have it in some different colors, actually. So it's called a Canson Mitientes, and I'll make sure to share that with Pamela so she can include it in the follow-up email. It's a pastel paper that comes in a lot of different colors. And this is from that inspiration of Thomas Moran. It's lightweight, so it dries really quickly and can be wonderful for sketching because that middle toned ground gives you a chance to add dark, such as black pen and watercolor, and then lights, such as white wash. So I'll be demonstrating that in a minute. And uh, finally, what's in sketchbooks, I use a whole range from moleskins to Stillman and Vern to Hanamule. So I brought a couple little examples to show you. Moleskin sketchbooks, um, they're lightweight, so they dry quickly. Convenient sizes, here's a little farmer's market sketch. Uh, Stillman and Burn, I found some sketches of um, Canada. This is going up to Nanaimo and up to um, Tofino some years ago on a Stillman and Burn sketchbook. I typically like the alpha. I know Opus carries these and they're, they're really lovely books. And then Hanamula sketchbooks uh, from Germany. These are really beautiful as well. And this is what I took to Norway last year. <clears throat> See some of the color studies and really beautiful paper, a little heavier, takes a little longer to dry, but nice and bright white. These are studying the colors I saw, not worrying about composition, just exploring. And then I have one more sketchbook that I thought you would really enjoy seeing just because it is so darn cute. And Hanamale makes a sketchbook called the Zigzag, and they make it in two sizes. And my favorite is the mini. This is like, I don't know, two inches by two inches. And it is so much fun for a little series of sketches or for taking on a trip. This was a little trip I did to Seattle. I love the narrative quality of a Zigzag sketchbook. I'll show you a big one too. Here's a little larger. Fairies figure large in my life. <laughs> I'm going to Seattle this fall and noticing the sunset. So working quickly, practice not perfection, capturing the big idea of things. And I want to invite you now to follow along with me as we do some sketching together. So I'm going to stop this share and just do a new screen share. And thank you all for your patience with my voice. I think I'm doing better now. Appreciate, um, appreciate your support. Okay.
Let's come back to our little penguin friend and hopefully we can see both screens now and tools for observation. So the first thing I wanted to cover was a little bit around page elements and layout. And I'm just working today in a larger sketchbook <clears throat> of a midweight kind of scratch paper, about a 90 pound for, for the examples today. But any of the smaller sketchbooks I'd showed you, of course, would work. Now, with any page, I often think about one, what are the different elements? Often there's a title, where are you, what are you doing? Kind of answering the W questions of who, what, where, when, why. And then layout, you might imagine that you're dividing your page into thirds or quarters, thinking about what are the different parts of your page? So there's your sketches, color studies, title, maybe there's notes. And as I'll show you, I often do little thumbnail sketches and boxes. So in giving yourself a moment to think about the different parts of your page and how you might put them together can help fill things up. So you might have, okay, a, um, I'm just using a big marker so you can really see these marks loudly. <laughs> might imagine you're gonna have a bunch of little squares or in one section, you might have some little color studies. The big thing I generally recommend is no matter how you're filling up your page, let yourself fill it and see it through. So if you remember one thing from today, actually there's gonna be at least two things I'd like you to remember. But one is see your pages through because even the quickest sketches, the loosest sketches, when you see them through and fill that page and add color, I think you'll find satisfaction in that. I know some people say, oh, I don't know if I like my sketches or, you know, that that practice shows. But I find that filling the page and thinking about the different elements can really help bring it together. So you might think about um, how you divide it, whether it's thirds or quarters. You might think about borders and boxes, little embellishments, little arrows. Let yourself play. You might be writing your text um around elements of your page right art is about play and let yourself play with it explore and have fun um the next things that we'll we'll practice in a minute are contour and gesture sketches which i love for natural objects and things that move and then finally thumbnail sketches now you see me with my hands making that box and I love making a viewfinder and squinting my eyes to look out at the world to simplify and see big shapes. So as you're out in the world, always ask yourself, how can I simplify, especially working quickly? So I want to take us, give us a moment to think about the palette of place with this little video from um, a beach just a couple miles from my house. I like to go swimming at this beach. Um, Every every few days, I love open water swimming. And as we as we just take a moment to watch this, you could start by some of those color notes. What colors do you see? It's a great way to get started. It's just painting the colors you see, not worrying about composition. Here I might think about the colors I see in the sea, in the sky, purplish blues. Do these have to be perfect? No, but they're a chance to warm up and play. Here I'm using a little buff titanium and um, new gamboche, looking at that building color. With these little circles or squares, however you like to do them, you might add in, um, I, often, I often like to add more than one color together to watch how they blend, get some of that warm up. Might think about what trees are in the background, mixing some greens. Here's a little phthalo green, mixing with a little bit of quinacridone gold. Oops, here we go. I'll show you those mixes. And that's too bright, so I'm going to dull that down with one of my favorites. Oh, let's see where it is. I think it's there. 
rearranged my palette not too long ago. Exploring with the colors you see, not worrying about composition. Sometimes facing that blank page can be a little bit intimidating. And this is a wonderful way to get started. Oh, and I, I have to paint. Oh, that's because I've got the wrong palette. That's why I'm confused. Aha! <laughs> I have a lot of palettes around. This one's decorated by my daughter. Here we go. I thought, gee, where's that blue that I always use? Here's a little uh, <clears throat> cobalt teal blue, which I love Daniel Smith for um, some of the, that cooler blue by the horizon. Hopefully you're getting to follow along and paint some of your blues. End and Throne Blue, a personal favorite of mine. Thinking about this is sand color. When I use a water brush, I, um, I love to wipe my brush off on a towel too between, between colors. I don't want to get them dirty. But you can see I, I only follow that to a certain degree. And you might think, Maria, uh, your palette's a little messy. What do you do if you run out of space to paint? Well, if that happens, then I squeeze a little water out with my water brush. And water brushes take practice to get the water handling. But then I just take my towel and give it a little wipe. But I, I don't clean it too often. I don't end with a pristine palette because my palette can have useful colors already mixed on it. I like to think about palette gray, which is a, 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 whatever my palette has ready for me. And let's mix a little color for the sky. One more gray. A little warmer blue. There we go. So doing some color studies. Along with these color studies, might add some notes below them with those page elements, the title, what do I see? What do I hear? Do you feel peaceful? What do you notice? Often I'll add notes about the weather just a place to get started. Now let's imagine we're on this beach and oh, here's a little example of, of a tone sketch I did. I'll share it with you for a moment while I pull out my next paper. Now, while we're on this beach, we might notice some animals. And that's where I want to share with you some tips for gesture sketching. Because I love gesture sketching. I love how um, they are fast sketches, um, trying to just capture the big idea. I'm sure many of you have done gestures. If you haven't, they're just an emphasis on shape and energy. And then it's amazing how they can be brought to life with a little bit of color. So we're gonna do a couple little gestures together. And um, I'm gonna work with this big bold marker again, just to really emphasize so you can really see my marks really loud and clear. Um, but I wanna start, actually, let me use this brush pen. It'll work just as well. I love this brush pen. So we're gonna do a couple timed sketches and the very before we get started just squint your eyes a minute and take a look at those goals and ask yourself what shapes do you see and goals kind of remind me a little bit of like footballs with legs they've got little round heads and kind of pointy beaks and then I'm gonna uh I'm gonna give us I think we'll start with a simple one but I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to sketch 
our first bird. And let's start with the one on the bottom left where we'll just focus on the body and the head and the feet. So in 10 seconds, my challenge to you is to get every element of this bird in just these 10 seconds. So on your marks, get set, sketch. And we're gonna start with those big shapes. You might think about your brush or your pen as a conductor's baton going around your subject matter. Oh, I have to just add a little wing shape. There we go, 10 seconds. And uh, then we'll, 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 we'll come up and we'll add in some details. So these first, these first few seconds, our goal of this gesture was to get the big elements, not just focusing on the head, not just focusing on the body, but the big picture. Okay, we're gonna to get to something a little more complicated. And this time I'm gonna give you something, a couple other little things to think about. Now, you might even start in the air and trace, hold your brush up to the computer and trace in the air, the different elements of that brush, imagining that your pen or brush is a conductor's baton, dancing around nice and light and fast, wings to tail to head. And you might not have time for this with every gesture, but often I'll use my pen as a measuring tool so I can line up my pen with an angle of what I see, which I'll, I'll be doing more later, lining it up with the angle I see. And if you've got time on this sketch, you might do it because I'm gonna give us 30 seconds to work our way around this goal. In the first 10 seconds, we're gonna work just as quickly as before. And then we're going to, um, uh, but we're gonna have a few more seconds. So maybe we'll add some more details. So squinting, maybe focusing on big shapes and starting in three, two, one, sketching. So we're going head, tail, wings, adding in the feet. All right, now I'm gonna, Try and add in some of those shapes, that bird. Getting big shapes of the body. And I like that fan. We've got 10 more seconds. Maybe there's a chance to add a little bit of extra detail. Maybe I'll add a little eye. There we go, 30 seconds. Now let's come around and we're gonna take a full minute for these last two. And for this last one with these two, with this full minute, oh, I'm even gonna give us a minute and a half. We'll take a little bit of extra. And in this last one, I'm gonna work a little larger here and we're gonna try and notice dark areas because one thing I always remind myself while sketching is to make your darks dark. So I'm gonna kind of pretend that these birds if you only want to focus on one bird, that's fine. But I'm going to kind of pretend they're the same, like they're, they're connected. And I'm just going to think about drawing them in the same sort of way from the head to tail of one body, head of the other, working my way around. And then at the end, I'm going to squint and try and ask myself, where are those darks? Are there any little spaces I can emphasize? So I'm going to get started in one second. Here we go. Big shape. I'm going to remind myself to work nice and big for you here. Head, body, and sometimes my brain short circuits a little with sketching and talking. There we go. Coming up, I'm paying attention to the space between the birds too, the negative shapes. Head, down to the feet. I love these little knobby feet. And we've got a full minute. So taking a pause, you might even take a breath, squint. Starting to look for some other details. Here I'm noticing some of these great lines, contours of the feathers, little eyes. 10 more seconds, some little extra elements of the beak. And I'm looking for some darks. I'm noticing there's some darks, the base of the body. There's some darks here under the wings, and I gotta give them something to stand on. I'm gonna give them a little something to stand on. There we go. So these, these really just took a minute, <laughs> a minute and a half, a couple minutes, a few minutes. And I'm gonna add some color to these just to show you how that little bit of color can really bring them to life. So uh, I see a question about gouache and 
I keep a dried gouache in my palette. I usually, um, I think I usually use a titanium gouache. Um, oh, looks like I've got permanent white today. So I'm not, maybe it depends on what I have. But uh, I love a little white gouache because you can mix it with other colors so that it, um, here, I'll try and keep my palette. Um, to kind of make more pastels. Oh, this is my daughter's bird. Here we go. This is a little better point. And, you know, just getting it wet, I'll get a pretty nice white. But if I squeeze a little bit of fresh paint, that will really help too. So I might squeeze a little fresh paint onto this. We'll see. But look how that white pops. This toned paper is already this beautiful middle ground, middle tone in value. And adding these simple colors is just going to help bring these really basic shapes of these birds to life. And I love gestures for birds because you can sit or any animal really and watch that animal or people in the coffee shop. And even if they're moving quickly, you might sketch them in different positions and take little mental snapshots and really get a sense of how they move, what they look like. Let's add a little more color here. And you might be thinking, Maria, do you always add white first or add a uh, color? And um, I'm not sure. I, I got kind of excited about my gouache and jumped in to show you. <laughs> so I, uh, um, I'll probably jump around and paint more than one of these at once so that it can dry a little so it doesn't bleed. So and, and gouache is, is um, in the same family as watercolor. It's just an opaque water based paint. So it's just more opaque, which is why it pops a little bit more on my paper. I'm going to come back to my palette and mix myself a gray. Sometimes I keep a little graphite in my palette, a color by Daniel Smith. Um, neutral tint or Payne's gray or other colors I like. But I'll, I'll really often mix my own grays. And one of my go-tos is Indian Throne Blue and Burnt Umber. And I'll go ahead and send a list of what these palette colors are to Pamela um, so she can share after the demo if you're interested. And Maria, I, yeah, been talking about how you clean your water brush. Oh, yes, yes. Or... Yeah, so um, my favorite kind of towel, you can use any sort of towel or cloth, but is a, a shop towel. These are often sold at hardware stores and they're just super durable and can even be rinsed and reused. So I give my brush a little bit of a wipe um, to clean it off. And then if I run out of color, this is what I do. I carry in my art toolkit um, a little bit of um, a little syringe without a needle. Um, and so then I can put this in my water bottle and squeeze up. And this way I'm not having to dump my water bottle water all over my water brush. And then I'm gonna unscrew the lid and just pop the water. Ooh, try not to uh, try not to drip on my painting here, but into my water brush to refill it. So that's a nice clean way to fill up your water brush if you don't have paints. Oh, and I see a terrific question, which is about um, filling pans. And I, I should just show you too how how to fill these. So I'll just fill myself one more little clean clean gouache to show you. Um, with the pocket palette pans or toolkit pans, the, the custom ability to customize them is, is just the biggest part. And to, to fill them up, I typically take them out of the um, pan, excuse me, out of the palette, and then I gently squeeze the paint in. Some artists like to keep them half filled. I, I usually prefer whole filled. Um, though I think half is a cool idea, then you can kind of pull down the paint. And then I find at the tip, I sort of scrape at the side, scrape the edge of the paint. And so now you'll see I've got this pan that's filled up and I usually leave my pans at least 24 hours to let them fully dry. It depends on the climate where you're from. And, um, uh, but then a lot of paints will um, sort of shrink in size. Let's see if I've got an example of one that's half filled. Here's a half filled pan. So you can see there's still room left in this pan. 
perylene orange, um, perylene orange. And so I could take that paint and top it off. And that way I've really got a lot of paint ready to go in the field that I'm really maximizing every bit I can carry. So that's a little tip for, for filling those. So I'm just going to throw a little bit more paint on these goals, and then we will move on to some contours. I love these bright beaks. Mixing more than one color together so my shapes aren't too flat. Squinting, trying to find any little darks. And then I might think more too about those page elements. What are those page elements? Are there any extra things I can add to make this page more interesting? So let's just throw a little bit of the beaks on. Always get in trouble going from blue to yellow that my yellow, if I don't wipe my brush, gets a little dirty. Brighten up those beaks. Oh, and look how that's starting to come together. Brighten up that beak. Try not to smudge. And let's get a little more gray. Oh, I'm getting some greens from my yellow. There we go. A little bit more gray that will just pop on here. for these quick gestures. On gestures, you might add in some other colors, like a little bit of a background to help get that sense of place around it. And this little sketch, that was that 30 second sketch with now just a little bit of color, and it's really turned into something that is a lot more true to what I was noticing and observing and is more fun to look at on the page than just a little simple um, line sketch. Um, when adding color around something in the field, if my internal colors are still wet, like the colors of the bird, I can leave just a little bit of white space around that so that it won't, um, won't bleed. So I hope this inspires you to play a bit with um, gestures and think about the page, additional things I might do to fill in this page, add a title, block a skull, what else I noticed, maybe how many birds I saw, what I was doing, and kind of fill that page in to be a really fun field sketch. Um, I see a note about gouache colors. I've typically just carried white, but I have to say that I'm having fun exploring gouache right now because um, there's there's been some some more kinds of gouache coming out um, Daniel Smith has a new line of gouache I've been, I've been curious about, but I'm not as experienced with um, other colors of gouache. Okay, so we've got our gull, and let's move on now to a Dungeness crab. And doing a, um, well, gosh, now I kind of want to do another tome, well, tome sketch. I had so much fun with that first one. Um, I think I will. <laughs> So working with a um, working with a contour sketch, contour sketches are another style where you can take a little bit more time to observe something. Like it might be an object that's not going to run away. Maybe you've got a feather or a shell. Um, here's this this fabulous crab. And um, and the contours are basically all the lines and outlines. And one of my favorite types of contour sketch to do as a warm up outside is continuous contour, where I keep my brush on my paper and don't pick it up, or I keep my pen on my paper. And this is so fun because it shakes me up a little bit. Sometimes we've just got to shake ourselves up outside to try something new and, and um, push our comfort zone a little and loosen up. Um, so let's start working our way around. And I'm just gonna keep my pen on my paper and noticing all the lines and outlines. And in this type of sketch, this is a chance to pay attention to the spaces between things, the shapes, positive shapes, negative shapes, spaces between, 
all the little details. I find this style a lot more meditative where working on a gesture sketch, I might be going as quickly as possible. And I'm still, I'm not gonna take too much time here, just a couple minutes. But I'm focusing on different things. Whereas before I was looking at that big idea all at once. With this one, I'm really working my way around, around the space. I'm giving myself permission Practice, not perfection. This doesn't turn out just so, that's okay, but I'm really getting to notice a lot. Notice details and I'm having some fun with it. Here, I'm kind of wishing that I'd started with that front claw. Pop my way back over here. I see some of these kind of different little patterns of even light water up here. Totally picked up my pencil pen, pen a little bit, but that is okay. Rules are meant to be tweaked. And here's that last little leg. And then I, I feel like I might just have to add a few little rocks in here. I'm totally picking my pen up a little bit. And you can do that too. There we go. All right. Contour sketch. And then just like before, can dive in and add some color. And in fact, I'm just going to focus on my desk now so you get a little bit bigger of a desk view. So I'm going to uh, stop this share and go back to just my desk for you. So we'll get this a little bit bigger. Mm -mm. All right. So just like before, this is an opportunity to add in some colors and squeezing my water brush a little bit on my surface. And I love that I've already got this nice ground of the paper. And with this more orange, it's kind of a chance to play a little with the colors mixing with the paper. And I'm still just imagining I'm outside. So you know what I'm doing? I am working fast <laughs> because it's a field sketch. You know, sometimes it might be that you've got um, 30 minutes or an hour, or sometimes it might be that you've just got 10 or 15, or you've got a little break while waiting to pick someone up in a park or what. But something I want to encourage you is just to take advantage of those little moments you have. That we don't need a lot of time for art. I'm getting really excited to put some of this gouache on the paper next. Okay. Keeping this light and fast. And I'm, I'm not using the fresh gouache on this. I'm just using my Bring in some of these highlights.
All right. I could spend like 20 minutes on this, but I do have one more type of sketch that I want to share and then have a little bit of time for some more questions. But let me paint a little bit of the background and then we'll move on. Color mixing is one of those things that gets easier with practice, I found. It gets more intuitive. But that's coming back to where I love that practice of mixing colors you see, not worrying about composition, just to play with what those are. And then making dark areas dark. And then on this toned paper, making the light areas light. Pushing value. I'll make, I'll make on our next sketch a little value scale in case that concept is something some of you are still working with. Wrapping your heads around. Some of these little rocks. Working quickly. Oh, I could just keep going with this, y'all, but here we go. A couple more little rocks. And I feel like it needs a few more little bright brights. How about some of these little dots on it? I'll, uh, let me get you the, um, the uh, crab again so you can see what I'm looking at. Fix that layout for you there. Pamela, let me know if that doesn't show up well. You can see how you could really just keep adding and adding to this type of sketch, but already it's got a more of a sense of dimension. Maria, it looks like that paper is holding up well to the water. Oh, it holds up terrifically well, even though it's light. And, you know, you often think with watercolor that you do need a heavy paper, but I find like 90 pound minimum works well. And then, then the advantage outside is that it dries quickly. So you're not sitting around waiting for layers. So in my studio, I'll use some heavier papers, but this is really one that's just great fun to play with. And you can pre-cut yourself, you know, buy some large sheets and pre-cut them to like a five by seven or four by six, you know, some fun, fun sizes to play with that you can keep in your kit or your backpack and um, be ready, ready to go with them. But I, I find it, it's a really fun approach. Oh, and I just want to keep going. But I do, I do have a little last um, technique I want to share with you all. And we'll, I think we'll pop over. But I'm going to give this a final squint and say, OK, are there any real darks I can add? Because making your darks dark, that's a mantra for me. And one thing I notice is under that face is like really dark. So I'm going to go in and just punch that up. See if I can punch up that claw a little bit with that dark value. Make that darks dark. There we go. Oh, I have a hard time stopping. <laughs> An artist friend of mine talks about having an imaginary like stop sign that he can hold up and being like, okay, stop, because it can be just so much fun to play. And of course, that is the whole point. One of the whole points of sketching to me is just, you know, art is a tool and among many things, it's a tool for bringing us joy and play. So uh, let's go on to our final tool. And um, this one is an image and see if I can kind of compose this better. How's that, um, how's the screen looking there, Pamela? Can you see? Um, yeah, I can see the image and also the screen that you'll be working on. Great. Let me move this over a little bit more. Okay. There you go. Try and get both nice and big. Um, 
so I'm going to come, come, come and do some white sketching with this one on my white piece of paper. I've gotten too wet. So finally, of course, land landscape sketching to me is something I love. And as I showed earlier, making a viewfinder is just a really terrific way to choose what you might want to sketch. Because then you can hold it up to your composition and think, okay, maybe I want to do, I can't quite bend my hands this way, a tall skinny panorama, a long skinny panorama, a little circle, just getting out there. And I often like to put things in boxes. Of course, you don't have to put them in a box, but I like some of the constraints of a box. And let's just draw a little box here. A tip that an artist friend of mine shared that I just love is she uses her pocket palette to trace. So when she does boxes on her paper, she'll literally trace her palettes to use them as rulers. Maybe I can do that for a little. I thought that was just the coolest. It kind of blew my mind because as you can see from my first line, I'm not very good at drawing straight lines. And that, that's not quite square, but I could do another little one because these are also a chance to play with composition. So one thing you might do if you're in a site is give yourself a couple different boxes, sketch the same thing a few times, but from different compositions or you might sketch something to your left, to your right, above you, behind you, playing with different compositions. We can even pull out a little demi if we wanted to do a little demi. And I'm sure many of you already are familiar with the, the rule of thirds from photography, which is basically just don't center your primary elements of focus. It imagines your viewfinder is divided into thirds and your elements of interest can go at these smaller points. So that just reminds me, well, just don't center things. So one of my habits, of course you can center them if you want to and play, but one of my habits is I often do a little bit of a higher horizon line or a little bit of a lower. And thumbnail sketches, I'm working a little bigger so you can see this, but I'll often do even like a couple inches by a couple inches. They can be really small. And that measuring trick here can be really helpful in saying, okay, how does something look compared with, can I hold my arm out with my pen at an angle and measure? And then the other cool thing you can do is use it for proportions and saying, okay, if my hand is held out at arm's length, are those trees as tall as a pen cap? And is the width, the, the width there of the beach, the water to the beach about a pen cap? Okay, you can estimate relative sizes of things together. And working on a landscape, I might still think about those kind of gestures. I love dancing my pen lightly around, sort of finding the composition. And it's okay to leave some of those more exploratory marks. And then it's also okay to kind of move things if I need to move things a little bit. And since this isn't quite a square, mine's gonna end up a little bit, a little bit different. But this is Salt Creek for those of you who are curious, which is a really beautiful park um, not too far from Port Angeles, across the water from, um, from Victoria. Place to surf, place to tide pool, beautiful place to camp. And I love the sense of dimension with the rocks. I'm squinting and seeing kind of that contour and bringing together some of these different elements we've looked at and focusing on the big shapes. And now, whoops, I'm not going to have enough space there. So look at that. I'm just going to leave a little space and we'll watch what happens to those, that space when I just paint over it. Myself a loose guide. I really love pens. And those of you who sketched with me might have heard me talk about like <laughs> scritchy, scratchy pens too. I enjoy pens that kind of scratch on the surface of the paper. And some people can't stand that. I, I, I love it. <laughs> So it's about finding the tools that resonate with you. Um, I'm going to add some textures and darks. I mentioned value earlier. Value is just the relative lightness and darkness of things we see. And I'll often imagine a little scale of three. So one would be lightest lights, two would be medium, and three would be darkest darks. And I might use hatch marks, these little diagonal marks. Cross hatch would be going the other way. 
I like to think about them as organized scribbles to help show depth. And this thumbnail is getting rather detailed and turning into a mini painting. So I'm going to uh, resist the temptation to do too much more, but add a little color to bring it to life. And again, one of the things I just want to keep emphasizing today is a little bit of color can go a long way for simple sketches and working quickly and hoping that it encourages your observations and fun while being out in the world. I typically start with the sky, working my way top to bottom, a little bit of purplish colors for the cloud. If you are working from photos, trust your memory too, because your photos, you know, the colors on your phone or your computer might be a little different from what you remember, or you might want to emphasize some things more. And of course, that's our creative license that we get to do that. And so you have you have 100% permission, <laughs> not that you need permission, but to play with the colors you see. Working my way down. I'm noticing some of these reflections. Of course, water reflects the sky. I'm pulling in some of the same colors. There we go. And Maria, mm -hmm. is there a reason for you choosing pen for this sketch versus say a graphite pencil? Yeah, I'm a fan of pen on my quick sketches. Um, so it's just a look that I really like. I really enjoy that record of mark. And some people love graphite too. And I, I do I do have pencils I enjoy, but um, in the field, they can sometimes smudge also. So I, I tend to not use pencil as much. Um, and I think too, for me, it's about speed. I find I'm really fast with pen. And sometimes I imagine that I'm creating a little coloring book for myself. Because once I've got like the shapes blocked in, then I can just fill in my little coloring book. Um, when I've got more time, I might want to do a sketch that is, you know, maybe a really light, quick pencil sketch and then watercolor, or it might have um, just direct to watercolor. And um, there's a fantastic um, artist, uh, Mark Terrell Holmes, who has the direct watercolor challenge. I think every June, he is really fabulous and I believe Canadian. Um, wonderful inspiration. But with an emphasis on being quick, for me, that pen is, is sort of one of the, the fastest. And here I'm just going to kind of erase that little bit of landscape that I wanted to shift the spot and let it sort of disappear as I finish my little painting. I want to make my darks dark, go in with trees. I love painting trees. Painting pine trees, I'll often do a little line down the middle and then dance my brush from side to side to bring them up. I'm using phthalo green and a little quinacridone gold or burnt orange. Phthalo green is often too strong by itself, but uh, quinacridone gold or burnt orange can really bring this nice tone to it for forests. Go to the other side. And Maria, would you mind repeating Mark's name for us? The yes, name? Mark Taro Holmes. T-A-R-O Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S. And I believe his website is citizensketcher.com. And he is, he's just fabulous. And um, we've corresponded over the years and I really, really enjoy and respect his work. There's, there's so many fabulous artists out there. <laughs> I always love learning about new ones too. Well, I wonder as I wrap this one up, Pamela, are there any questions I can answer? 
Uh, you know, there was a question earlier on uh, about how you add alcohol into your water while working in really cold environments. Mm -hmm. What kind of proportion, how do you go about that? Do you put it in your water or is it just direct alcohol that you dip your brush in? Yeah, great question. I typically will put it in my water brush and 50-50 has worked pretty well for me. Um, so it's not too strong. So I'll do a little bit of water and a little bit of um, the alcohol, about 50-50. Um, but you can experiment and see what works with your paper. I mean, you need, that's where I, I don't do too much so it doesn't damage the paper. Um, and then of course, there's, there's other approaches too, like um, taking color notes. So if you're somewhere where you don't have time to, to um, completely add color, let's say I was working on this beach and had to go, um, I might just make notes of the colors I see or do some of those little color dots. And then when I'm home in my studio or comfortable in my tent or wherever, um, can add in some of those additional colors and, and whoopsies, um, finish it. Thank you. And something I often do in my um, sketchbook is I love adding little frames around these thumbnail sketches that just makes them feel a little bit more complete. Sometimes I'll add a little purple or pink or whatever might end up matching the page and uh, putting that little frame around it. And uh, do you provide any classes? Uh, do, you, do you teach classes online? I sometimes do. Um, we also, so at Art Toolkit, we offer, we host workshops with other artists as well. And um, I may, I may be doing one soon. We've got also other in-person events happening. We've just started doing more in um, our local area and have a few planned this summer. Um, so the best place to hear about workshops, whether by me or some of our artist friends, is on our website, arttoolkit.com. At the bottom, you can sign up for our newsletter, and that's the, the best place to hear about them first. Um, there we go. I think I might need to declare this done so I don't over fiddle with it. Um, I'll pull my, whoops, please pull my face back up. We covered a lot today, but as just the big takeaway, remember, practice not perfection, play. Uh, that art's a tool. And I hope the tools we've practiced today inspire you to keep them in your back pocket. And whether you've got five minutes or half an hour or three hours, just to play, explore, and um, see the world through some other perspectives.